every couple days of practice so far, just how has practice been this week? Been good. Uh, good tempo. I uh, thought yesterday was nice and cool. Had a great practice. Today was not the best Tuesday, but not the worst. It was uh, a little warmer, but had good energy and gosh, practice hard. Coach, when you had a chance to go back and watch it, how did you feel like they were ever played? And just, I guess, speak about the challenge that Leggett and Rattler presented. <laughs> Man, uh, Dalen played okay. Um, he uh, he can play uh, with a little more confidence. Um, he's a good football player. He's still getting comfortable in, in the big games and the big moments. Um, he understands the defense. He tackles well. He plays physical. It's hard to block, which in this league it's a it's a big man league. So you got to have some weight under you. You got to be able to hold the hold the point. As far as Leggett and Rattler, I've, I've talked about them enough. They're really good players. Kirby, I was reading something about the halftime speech or lack thereof, and I don't know, somebody said you, you, you were going to get on them, but then a sport of psychology, what, what, was, what was the conversation and, and as far as how you addressed the team at halftime against Carolina? Where or did you hear that? Like, what are you talking about? You I was going to get on them. It's one of the walk-ons when said something on his I don't know. I don't know what he's referencing. I guess I would need better details as to I was going to get on them. And then you talk to a sports psychologist, and sports, supposedly this was what the narrative was out there, and the sports psychologist has gone. Not that I know of. I mean, I, we have a guy that works for the team, um, and he does a great job, Drew. Um, he, 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 he gave our team a message on uh, Friday before the game, uh, and he spent uh, the game with us. But I don't really know. I don't know what you're referencing as far as that goes. I mean, I, I have varying messages at halftime. I mean, it just depends on how we're playing, what's going on, if we're playing with emotion, not playing with emotion. I mean, there's a lot of decisions to go into how you approach it. Um, at that time, I don't know what good getting on was going to do. Yeah, Kirby, just wondering if you had reached out to Nick Chubb at all in the unfortunate incident last night. And then yeah. how important was he to this program, and still is to this program, given all that he does and all that he represents? Yeah, he's an incredible human being, first and foremost. What, what, what kid still goes back to their high school weight room, strength coach, program, track, and works out like he does, and just uh, just very rare in the sports world to find someone as humble and uh, just a great person that he is. And I reached out to him. Um, I know he's probably been flooded with all kinds of, you know, people reaching out to him, so no expectation of anything in return. Just a lot of respect for him and what he did for this program in terms of toughness, buy-in, giving back. I mean, he... Uh, he decided to come back when he did. I thought it was in his best interest to come back, but he certainly uh, did UGA a favor returning too, and uh, what an outstanding year he had when he did. I talked to Ron about it today, and uh, you know I think he'll I think he'll make a full recovery and bounce back. That's just who he is. So he'll be ready to get after it. Kirby, uh, three weeks of the I guess data probably aren't looked at with the clock rules and everything, but it seemed like a lot of the complaining has been from offensive. As a more defensive coach, but also a guy who was on the committee, where do you stand on where things are? I don't really know. I actually sent a text to the analytics people we uh, have a subscription to, and uh, he sent me a text back immediately and said, you know, I asked week one, and he said, well, it's more than they thought. He said, but you can't judge it on one week. And after week three, last weekend's numbers were in, he texted right back and said, it's right where we thought. He said, 21, 22, I want to say he said 175, 175 snaps a game maybe, and they're just 170. So it's five snaps a game after three weeks. And, I mean, you can quote me on it because I said it, but don't, I don't know if it's fact. I'm going off what somebody told me. So they told me 175 to 170, so it's actually five plays difference. Is that the same thing you're hearing? Three per team. Three plays per team. That makes sense because they're saying 5.5. .5, so three per team is six, and what I was told is five and a half. So <coughs> it, that's not substantial. But I don't, I don't know why I even feel like it's more than that because I feel like, you know, maybe they should study it by possession. And I have not done the math on possessions, not plays, because it seems less. It seems faster. You know what I mean? But uh, I, don't, I don't know what impact it's had. Um, because the number, if you do it by number of plays, that's minimal. I mean, that's just minimal three plays per game. That's, I mean, three plays per game per team. I don't, I don't think that's a major deal. It feels like possessions. Yeah, possessions matter. 
yeah. possessions. But I, I can't sit here and tell you the possessions because I didn't ask that number if possessions are down. If three plays are down, then it shouldn't be possessions down. How have uh, Kendall and Roderick looked so far this week? Uh, Kendall's been in rehab. He's been rehabbing and working, and Roger hadn't been able to practice with us. So um, they haven't looked good in terms of practice because they haven't been out there. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can get them back. Uh, it doesn't look – it looks very doubtful that Roger's going to be able to play this week. Um, I'm still holding out hope that, that Kendall might be able to, but uh, you know, I, I can't say that because he has not practiced yet. Kirby, we see some, some programs that seem to be affected by, by crowd noise more than others, and Georgia's not one of those programs, I guess I would ask. Is that something that you work on every day? That, that seems to be one of the more drilled. I mean, everything's pretty drilled, obviously, but can you talk about your commitment to that? Well, we haven't. I mean, I don't know what makes you think we're not affected by crowd noise. years, your, your first seven years. What's the measure of that? Uh, I saw Tennessee have, I think, five people jump and two timeouts against Florida, and then last year I saw them have about six. I haven't noticed that with you guys in big game environments. Yeah, it's tough, man. I, I don't think – see, I think that the NFL teams don't experience it until the playoffs. I think the SEC teams in the SEC environment and, you know, I'm sure there's other conferences. I'm not saying we're the only ones with crowd noise. I know Florida went to Utah, and that was a game I got to see where it was impacted. It's a major deal. I mean, I study it hard because – I go through and watch third and fourth down reel of uh, of the league, every every league game, and, and it's amazing to me the team that's on the road, the number of times it impacts third and fourth down. It's incredible, uh, and you try like hell to avoid those, but we we haven't played in that environment. You know, like we we haven't. I can't remember the last year. I think Missouri, we had a false start open the game. Um, and maybe two others in the game. So I, I can't sit here and tell you it has not affected us. It, it, it affects us when you go into a, a tough environment. How do you prepare them? Like, you, well, you just turn on crowd noise and try to simulate it, you know. But um, you prepare by, you know, maybe doing a little less and, and taking a few plays out that, that are hard communication plays, checks, motions, adjust. I mean, you just, you, you got to be smart. I call them, you know, a relief play. You got to line up and go play and see if you can lock them without doing too much you know and the more you try to do I don't think some coaches acknowledge that it's six penalty advantage to play uh, at home in the SEC possibly I mean it's, it's come out that way for us because teams have come here and gotten probably five six more penalties on average and you, you got to try to find a way to avoid that when you go on the road are you guys sticking with Peyton on field goals, are you making a switch? Yeah, we're, we're having competition. I mean, like I said all along, it was going to be open regardless. We're <clears throat> competing every week. The competition every week has been uh, pretty consistent. They've been pretty even. But with the outcome of the games, you know, you have to continue to open it up. We did uh, a bunch of exercises to try to put some pressure on those guys today, and we'll do the same thing throughout the week and then make a decision. That, that's, that's minute to minute, hour by hour. Coach, with the uh, running back injuries, I'm just wondering about, about Dylan Bell. It's number one. How much does he get to work on things like pass coverage? Obviously, it's very important. With these injuries, is there a case where you may be more to play more running back than you previously have? Well, he's got a package, and the, the package each week, they've tried to expand it and go uh, piece by piece because we think he's a very valuable receiver, and that's what he remains as a receiver for us. And uh, uh, his package first week was a few plays. His package the next week was a few plays, and we've added plays each and every week. And yeah, he does pass pro. He does, you know, learns our protections, and he's really a very physical player. Like he plays on special teams, strikes people. He's 210 pounds, so he's bigger than Cash and some of our other backs. Coach, I know you guys are obviously focused on the season. But with the way the portal windows are now set, there's gonna be like hundreds of kids that enter the portal at one time. Is there any way to be proactive in your scouting? Are you guys going through and maybe evaluating other rosters? Or is it all a reactive scouting measure where they enter, you evaluate whether or not they'll be a fit, and go on from there? Yeah, I don't. I mean, everybody's got a new staff that goes and evaluates the, every player. I mean, I've been told there's teams out there on the sidelines of our game scouting our players and warm ups because that's their job for their, their team is to know something about that kid if he goes in. And, uh, we're not that advanced. I'm not really that interested in it. I mean, obviously, there's never a kid that goes in the portal we would not consider unless we didn't like him coming out or had, you know, some reason not to recruit him coming out. But I'm not going to go in advance and do that because I just, I mean, 
might scout a thousand kids and, and, and ten of those thousand you know, end up going in and I could take that ten minutes and, and go watch them when they go in. And to be honest with you, from what I've seen, when they go in, they all know where they're going. You know, it's not, it's not the one kid that when he told me he was leaving, he didn't already have a plan of where he was going. Coach, it seems like Jalen Walker bulked up a lot since last season. I was wondering if that was his decision or if that was a coaching staff suggestion to bulk him up and get him on the weight. I don't think he's bulked up. He's 240, 242. I think he was 236, 237 last year. So maybe he looks that way or maybe I'm just wrong. But I don't, I don't want him bulked up. I want him fast. and. Uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, he's been an excellent edge rusher for us. He's developing as an inside backer, and I like him the way he is. Speaking about Jalen and, and Sorry too, how important is it to have guys who can play inside and also brush up the edge when you need them? And do you feel that's maybe a more important skill set to have with how offenses are in college football nowadays? Not really. I think that if you have outside backers that can rush, that, that, that it's a luxury to have an inside backer that can rush. And Sori has developed that skill set because when he came in, he was a, a natural, really speed guy, edge guy. I think the, the 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 element in pro football and college football has become how much speed can you get on the field. Um, and with all the passing, you know, Jalen and Sori give us uh, an abundance of speed. They're two of our fastest players, and they're able to chase things down, run things down. You know, they were both in the play on the screen and. I uh, hated it for both of them. They both had an opportunity to make the play, and neither did. But that, that's why they're out there, for those kind of plays. Wondering, uh, Coach Malachi's obviously from around here from Jefferson. Uh, and he's played a ton for you in these first two years. When did he first come on your radar? Uh, did you know about him really early? And when you got a guy like that, that everybody in the country is coming after, he's in your backyard, does that even turn up the sort of the pressure even more that you got to keep this guy around? I don't think you can get any more pressure on a good player because, I mean, it's it's the, whatever the full amount of pressure is, it's the full amount. It doesn't get any greater than, than infinity. So he's 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 a really good player, and there was always that. I think I think his home life, his mother, father, the, the community of Jefferson, uh, he was very grounded. He was never – he was – I don't want to say a homebody. He just never really was interested in going all over the place. It reminded me of Charlie Warner. He's like, I really just don't want to go to all those places. I, I want to go to Georgia. That's what I want to do. And he knew that. And he came on campus as a ninth grader. I remember. Um, I can't even remember who the DB coach was here. Then, then it was so long ago. It, it, it might have been. I don't know who it was, but he came over. Says, "Dad's here. He's ninth grader. He's just coming off a broken leg from basketball, and he ran really fast for us. And he had a really big frame. And I thought, man." This kid's going to be a good player. He was playing quarterback, so it was a tough evaluation. It was a projection as a safety, but once we got to know the kid, he came over here a thousand times over three years. Uh, just loved the, the character and the integrity of his family and, and what they stand for, and, and really him. He's a, he's a great kid. Yeah, just that offensive line competition with Amarius being out. How's Blasky looking right now? And then Obviously, trust and fair child is factoring into that. Yeah, trust has worked guard and tackle just like he always has. More tackle this week. Um, Blasky has practiced, and he is a tough dude. But he, I mean, he's hurting. I mean, he's he's trying his best out there. And you know, O line is a you know it's a position that you might get away with a little bit of an MCL because you're not out there on space running and cutting. But I mean, he's not 100 percent healthy. You know, so he's out there working Monroe's. Um, working at tackle, uh, Bo's been Bo's been developing, playing some at tackle. Uh, Dylan can go out and play tackle. Micah can go out and play tackle. Uh, Chad Lindbergh plays tackle. So uh, we got musical chairs. We're just trying to get it where if the next guy goes down, we can get the best guy in. Coach, I know you mentioned uh, Eddie Gordon a little bit mm -hmm. yesterday. I know when he was here, he was a very popular guy with, a, with your, your offensive lineman. Kind of what? Why was that? Why was he such a well, he's a great recruiter. He's a great coach. He's a hard worker. I have a lot of respect for Eddie. I don't think, you know, of the people we've had in the organization that have left, somebody told me it's like 24 guys that have come here, worked in some capacity, and moved on to a, uh, you know, a, another maybe on the field role or a, a, a role higher than they were here. And he was a guy that was, he was loyal. He, he worked hard. He recruited a lot of good players here. 
Uh, he was right alongside of uh, Sam. And he was right alongside of Matt Luke. He was right alongside of, of, of Searles. And uh, he has a personality about him. He, he never backed down from coaching players hard. And I respect that in a coach because he didn't, uh, he didn't try to be their friend. He, uh, he coached them hard and uh, recruited them hard and got a lot of respect for him. And you see it in the way his line plays, man. They, they're going to be wound up for this one because I know Eddie, Eddie wants to, to represent and, and his kids to play well. How did uh, Lindbergh uh, kind of grade out, or not specifically, but you know, when you guys went to tape, playing, I guess, more snaps than uh, maybe expected? Playing more snaps. Where do you play? Did he come in when, uh, when you guys pushed Russ to tackle? No, that was a fair job. I'm, I'm a fair job. I'm sorry. No, Dylan, Dylan, Dylan played well. I mean, he. I think the amount of time he played leading up to that game uh, had helped him. You know, he had played meaningful minutes. Uh, he's practiced with the ones. I mean, he's going against our defensive line uh, all camp, so I think he came in pretty confident. And uh, he had a few arrows, but hell, they all did. I mean, he 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 he, he played well, and he's like I said. He, I think we think of him, Jared, Micah, those guys as, as starters. Kirby, I know you said with Javon, he was a game time decision this past week. How has he looked so far in practice? Yeah, he hasn't been able to do much. He um he warmed up, didn't feel great in warm ups. Uh, shut him down uh, and hasn't done much this week in terms of being able to practice. I asked him today, you know, and he's he's underwater running, um, um, got a boot on, um, but he has not not been able to practice. Coach, I know you guys don't use the portal to the extent that others do in college football, but have you seen any major impact on high school recruiting? You know, got teams taking dozens of guys in the portal. They can't take high school kids. Has your pool of prospects gotten any larger? Uh, you lost me on the last statement. Um, how would our pool get larger? There's because more high school kids available if they're not going to college. Well, yeah, but I mean, we're, we're talking about, we're recruiting the top 10%. I don't think that part's changed. I think it's definitely changed at a different level. You know, I, I don't think at the SEC level that the pool of, I mean, the pool of the kids that we'd be signing probably wouldn't be signing at the SEC, you know, they would be signing somewhere else. So, I mean, if anything, it may help our, our walk-on or preferred walk-on program because those kids that would have gotten scholarships other places, they're all they're all taking kids out of the portal. And I think that's, you know, that's the right of a coach. And you can look and point to some pe some teams that have done an incredible job and, and, and have caught a program up really fast versus some that you, you catch a year where you don't get enough out of the portal and you got nothing developing and you, you end up in a bad situation. I, I don't know because I'm, I'm not in the portal industry as much. I mean, we're going to always look and try to take a great player, but I'm not going to live and die by it. I want to develop players and, and bring them in from freshmen all the way up. Let's take two more questions. You had uh, Matt Godwin as your director of player personnel for a long time, and then you transitioned to Will Myers. I just wanted to know how you found out about him, and how do you think he's done so far this season in terms of evaluating and finding prospects? Well, he does a lot more than that. I mean, uh, we don't put evaluation on that position like some people do. Our our our, my, our coaches, I'm like I'm, my position coaches, are always going to be evaluators. I don't believe in a system where once somebody comes in and tells you who fits your program. Matt didn't do that. He he was a very valuable asset in terms of uh, opinions of looking over the top so you have someone looking at all these players someone looking at all these players who's comparing this row to this row you know who's comparing the receivers to the offensive linemen like that's a hard comparison which one's a greater need so that's what they help with more than anything and, and I, I don't really know how we found out about Will Myers I mean he worked with Muschamp at South Carolina so there was a little bit there uh, we had a couple other links I think he had been with, uh, you know, he'd been over at ULL, and so a lot of the same kind of family tree, coaching tree, and, uh, and it, it thought it was good to be around him in the interview, and he did a good job. He was very detailed, very organized, and that's what we needed in that position. Coach, what's the story on the coach's jacket? It seems pretty warm and tired. Everybody doesn't like it. I don't know. It's, for me, it's the first one I pick up every time I go in there, and they said something about they don't make any more like this with the band at the bottom. So I don't like the kind that hangs loose. And there's 64 coaches' jackets in my locker that have hang loose, and there's only one with a band at the bottom. So I wear the one that has a band at the bottom. <laughs>